And it is also a particular pleasure to be here on this 20th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. It's a real pleasure to be speaking here in a Berlin that it is once again united and free. So thank you all for allowing me to be here on this special occasion. I will not do as a famous president of the United States did and, uh, and say, ich bin ein Berliner. I will say instead, ich bin Berlinerisch. <laughs> well, now a horse goes into a bar and the barman says, why the long face? <laughs> because it's a horse, you idiot. And the reason why I show this slide is because all the points I'm going to make to you, as befits points made by a layman for scientists, will be blindingly obvious points. You won't find anything clever, complicated, or difficult to agree with in what I say. I'm going to make some straightforward, simple points. The IPCC likes to make things complicated. I'm going to make them simple again. Now, if we go back a thousand years to medieval Iraq, the gentleman on the banknote that you see there is the father of the scientific method. Abu Ali ibn al-Hassan ibn al-Husayn ibn al-Haytham. And he said, the seeker after truth, and that is what scientists were called in those days, seekers after truth, does not rely upon any consensus, however venerable. Instead, he subjects what he has learnt of it to his own hard-won knowledge, scrutiny, investigation and measurement. For the road to the truth is long and hard, but that is the road that we must follow. In other words, we're not here to preach. And therefore, please, do not believe a word I say. Science is not a belief system. And that is one of the biggest arguments that we in this room have with those who do simply believe everything they are told without checking. In religion you may do that, in science you may not. And now I'm going to take a vote. How many of you here believe that global warming is or ever could be, the anthropogenic sort of it anyway, a problem? Right, that's the end of my talk, thank you very much. <laughs> what I want to do is look very quickly at today's climate. The temperature has been on a falling trend and a very clear one for nine years. And this is an illustration of that from Willie Soon at uh, Harvard. I'm very grateful for that. The sea ice in the Arctic, which the Greenies were talking to me out about there, I said, why do you believe? in this global warming stuff. Ooh, the sea ice in the Arctic has been disappearing, they said. And sure enough, in 2007, the purple area on the leftward graph there, uh, about 27% of what would normally be there wasn't there. NASA said at the time this was caused by exceptional winds and currents from the Arctic, nothing uh, from the tropics, nothing unusual. And as you can see in 2008, in the middle 2009, on the right, it has re-established itself almost entirely back to its normal level. But at the same time, as the Arctic ice reached its 30-year minimum, and of course we've only got 30 years of records of the ice extent at either pole, because it's only the satellites that can give them to us, literally three weeks after that sea ice minimum in the Arctic, there was a sea ice maximum for the 30 years, in the Antarctic, where indeed there's been a generally rising trend in sea ice extent over the last 30 years. So whatever else caused that temporary loss of ice in the Arctic, it cannot possibly have been global warming, can it? And here is the heartbeat of global sea ice extent, and if you had a heartbeat as fit as this, you would be passed as a well man. Now here is Greenland, where we hear that the ice sheet is collapsing into the sea. Well, Johannesson et al. in 2005 published a paper in which, by using a very old-fashioned, very well-tried and tested method, 
satellite altimetry, they found that the ice was in fact thickening at five centimetres per year. I was so intrigued by this, I got the Department of Defence in the United States to send me these photographs. Two on the left are of the Dewline radar stations as they were 35 years ago when they were in operation, on the right as they are now. Sometimes the Mark I eyeball is quite a good way of verifying whether the laser altimetry or the rather eccentric from the gravitational anomaly satellite are the right ones. Eurasian snow cover. This is what actually supplies uh, wa the water supply of a quarter of the world's population. Not the melting ice from glaciers, but the snow cover. It shows no trend throughout the last 40 years in any of the five vital winter months. That's from Rutgers University Snow and Ice Lab. Hurricanes also doing very nicely, thank you. Just a few weeks ago, the uh, combined frequency, duration and intensity of hurricanes, typhoons and tropical cyclones all around the world reached its 30-year low. Not exactly consistent with alarmism. Here is the record of temperature change in the area around the Great Barrier Reef. So if anybody tells you that the corals in the Great Barrier Reef are being destroyed by global warming, no, they're not. There's been no trend in sea surface temperatures in that area at all. So that, then, is a picture, I put it to you, of a normal, healthy climate, which is changing a little bit here, changing a little bit there, changing back again. Nothing exceptional, nothing unusual, just as Professor uh, Singer has just said. So why, then, is there this worldwide bedwetting about the climate? And the reason is that various people in the climatological community together with various politicians, with whom they are financially as well as politically linked in various ways, have decided over the last 20 or 30 years to fabricate a case that we have a problem with the climate. You may have heard of the publication recently by a whistleblower at the University of East Anglia of thousands of highly compromising emails between all of the leading scientists who have been part of this conspiracy to tamper with the scientific data and whose activities I have been following with some interest for the last two or three years. And those emails reveal incompetent programming, tampering with data, bullying of journal editors, lying to the public, blocking freedom of information requests for data so that other scientists could verify it, destroying data that had been requested, procuring others to destroy data that had been requested, scientific and financial fraud running into the millions, and racketeering. That is what these emails reveal, but not if you believe nature, which said, well, this is a storm in a teacup, and the whole thing is the only reason why these people behaved in the least bit in the way that scientists shouldn't is because they were under pressure from all those nasty denialists and skeptics. Well, the fact is, they're crooks. That's what they really are. I call them the traffic light tendency. They call themselves green because they're too yellow to admit they're really red. <laughs> this is the kind of thing they circulate. This was actually used as part of a lecture given at Lloyd's of London three weeks ago. I'm sorry, I'll try and get that to come back. Yes, there it is. The, it shows the Houses of Parliament being flooded by the waters of the Thames surging to new and... And my question is, your problem is? We'd just love to see the Houses of Parliament <laughs> destroyed. So here then, I'm going to take just a few of these crooks and we're going to look at what each of these crooks has done. I'm going to show you what their crookedness is because this is an organised, systematic, scientific fraud. All the names you see on there, this is only a selection. 